Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Did Foreign Minister Jay Shankar in his speech to the United Nations General Assembly in September deliberately break with well-established diplomatic traditions, thus revealing internal differences and different divisions to the outside world and raising deeply troubling questions? An article in The Hindu on Friday categorically suggests that the answer is yes. Joining me now to discuss the article and his reasons for writing it is one of India's well-known former secretaries in the Ministry of External Affairs, the highly regarded former ambassador to Afghanistan and Burma, Vivek Kartchu. Mr. Kartchu, in the article you wrote for the Hindu on Friday the 7th, you said Foreign Minister Jay Shankar's speech at the United Nations General Assembly raises several deeply troubling questions. Before I come to details, has either the foreign minister or anyone from the ministry got back with a defense of the foreign minister's speech? No, they haven't, and I don't expect them to. So from their side, there is total silence? Yes, which I suppose is normal, but uh, that is what it is. Let's then come to the details which were in that article. First, the foreign minister told the United Nations, India is rejuvenating a society pillaged by centuries of foreign attacks and colonialism. That phrase, pillaged by centuries of foreign attacks, refers to the period starting with Muhammad of Gore in the late 12th century and ending with the end of the Mughal Empire. Now, as you said in that article, this is clearly a disparaging reference to Muslim rule in India. But it's how the Modi government refers to this period when it speaks to an Indian audience all the time. Why was it wrong to use the same terminology in the United Nations? Uh, in the United Nations, uh, as far as my memory goes, we've always taken national positions, uh, positions which have grown through consensus and which reflect our constitutional values. We've never taken our controversies abroad. That has been the tradition because of the UNGA statement is perhaps the most authoritative expression of India's position uh, at, in, before the international community. And uh, the tradition has been that uh, we express this forthrightly and our basic focus is on international issues, which Jay Shankar, of course, also did in his speech. And he did it very well, as I've said in that art. On international issues, there was no problem at all. But when it came to the situation within India, uh, he raises, issues, he uses expressions, which I think troubled me. That is why I wrote that art. So what you're saying is that Talking about issues within India, Mr. Jay Shankar revealed to the world controversies, dis differences and disputes which should not have been revealed. These are internal matters. They are not issues that we project to the world. Uh, now, the world knows what is happening in India. After all, there is no iron curtain. There. 
we have embassies here who which also report but we ourselves uh, do not speak of these uh, controversies of, in international settings as it were especially in the UNGA that was the tradition that uh, we don't focus on now because, you wrote, uh, uh, you wrote in that article and i'm quoting you this is a dangerous path to undertake for domestic controversies are best avoided when national positions which have to be necessarily rooted in the constitution are authoritatively articulated abroad here this is not a formal national position it's not rooted in the constitution and yet it was articulated abroad now uh, look uh, for mr jay shankar and uh, the present ruling dispensation it well may be that's a different aspect but it is controversial there is an enormous ideological contestation taking place within india and i think that contestation is best left uh, inside india we don't take it outside ourselves uh, there has been a complete consensus on colonialism our position on colonialism is obvious and that is why the mind field of history of pre colonial india we have avoided whenever we articulated our, our positions abroad that was my reference uh, that uh, when he says centuries of the of foreign of foreign attacks and colonialism i think that formulation made a distinction between colonialism and centuries of foreign attacks and that is what troubled me and my inference of that was that it began that that was a reference to muslim rule beginning with the arab conquest of sind and then the invasions of mahmud ghazni and thereafter uh, the establishment of the sultanate after mahmud uh, mohammad ghori uh, defeated uh, the rajputs uh, in the 12th century uh, we've never taken all that abroad as far as uh, and especially on in the unga and in multilateral settings Now, that is why i Daniel? thought and one last sentence that is why for uh, what has been our own controversies about uh, our history and that's natural within india we will have controversies and historians and political parties and will differ on this but we don't take it outside now you also say in that article and i'm quoting you as a former diplomat mr jay shankar will be well aware of the indian diplomatic tradition which has always presented nationally unified positions abroad particularly at the un so in this instance the foreign minister was deliberately and consciously breaking with well established tradition well uh he broke with tradition how he and why he broke with tradition is something only he can answer uh, i cannot uh, use the terms that you used because i do not know and i have not uh, discussed this with him and i don't expect to that uh, why did he use the formulations that he did forgive me i'm interrupting i didn't say why he broke with tradition i said he deliberately and consciously broke with tradition now uh, that is why i don't know whether it was deliberate and conscious that is why i said i don't know why uh, I, I, i don't I, know the background of it are you truly suggesting that someone who is as experienced as mr jay shankar he's been foreign secretary he's been ambassador in washington and beijing are you suggesting that this could have happened accidentally or even as a result of carelessness uh jay shankar is a is a very skillful diplomat he's been an old colleague i have deep respect for his professional competence uh i will leave it at that but in which case it couldn't have been accidental and it couldn't have been carelessness therefore it must have been deliberate there can't be i will not alternative. I I will not draw those inferences because I have not spoken to him now I'm not trying to uh, evade your question but as a, 
I've been trained as a diplomat. I do okay. textual analysis. So I, unless I've spoken to someone, I cannot say that, look, why has this come? It has come. I understand come. your position, but I, I will I underline for the audience. I understand your position, but I'll underline for the audience that this break with tradition could only have happened in one of two ways. It was accidental or carelessness. And the other is that it was done deliberately. Let the audience decide which it was. All I'll point out to the audience is that Mr. Jay Shankar is far too experienced to let an accident of this nature happen or to allow carelessness to lead to this happening. His experience would have guarded against it. But let's move to the second element that you picked up in your article. Again, it's to do with Mr. Jay Shankar's speech to the United Nations General Assembly. He said, and I'm quoting, India's rejuvenation is reflected in more authentic voices and grounded leadership. Now, you find that phrase, authentic voices and grounded leadership, a disparaging reference to governments and prime ministers who ruled India before Mr. Modi. But once again, this is precisely how this government refers to earlier predecessor governments and particularly to Mr. Nehru's government. Why was it wrong to use that same language at the United Nations? Uh, I'll have to, uh, and please permit me to tell you how my mind works on these issues. India, as I wrote in that article, uh, was unique because we, in 1950, uh, introduced adult franchise. So the people decide. And in election after election, the people chose representatives. And that basic exercise is the very foundation of our constitutional and political system. Because power is exercised by the people through the electoral process and through the representatives they choose. Now, if we start going into the question of whether the representatives chosen by the people who were from among themselves authentic and grounded or whether they were not, then we open a minefield. Because I, for one, find it deeply, deeply troubling when I am informed that at one stage the Indian people chose authentic representatives and grounded representatives and at another stage that they, they did not. What is this argument? After all, people chose representatives who in turn decided that the leadership, the executive leadership would west, say with Pandit Nehru. They chose representatives and they decided that it would west with uh, Mrs. Gandhi, with, uh, other, with uh, Rajiv Gandhi, with other prime ministers, with Mr. Nasuma Rao, with Mr. V.P. Singh. And today, in 2004, from 14 onwards, those the very people, those very people have decided that it will that their representatives will uh, be from the present ruling dispensation, who in turn have chosen uh, the prime minister. Mr. Can I interrupt? So, can I interrupt? What you're saying is that not only is Mr. Jay Shankar speaking disparagingly of previous prime ministers like Nehru and Indira Gandhi. But in addition, he is also speaking disparagingly of Indian democracy because he's suggesting that in a free and fair election conducted on the basis of adult franchise, India was electing inauthentic and ungrounded leaders. So it's a slight not just on the leaders, but on the democracy as well. I think it is... Uh an interpretation of democracy, uh, which, and I'm sorry to use the word uh, again, it troubles me a great deal. I, I must confess that uh, my own discipline uh, in the university was history, it was not political science or uh, sociology. But I think the very, my own understanding is that the very root of our system is our electoral process, and that is something which is unique in India. We are very okay. proud of. And so can I put it like you, this? No, can just I... let me just, uh, just one sentence more. So when you say that some leaders who were chosen by the people were 
say less authentic, less grounded than others, then it is necessarily a reflection on the choices of the people. And are we then going into the question of the wisdom of our people? That in is fact, happening. In fact, there is a further point one can make. India is very proud of the fact that we are the world's largest democracy. We say that all the time from every platform. Now, when you question the nature of the leaders, the character of the leaders that the Indian people have freely and fairly through adult franchise brought to power, you're actually casting an aspersion upon the nature of the world's largest democracy. All of that follows from what Mr. Jay Shankar has said. I won't go to that extent, uh, uh, Karan, but I would uh, very seriously urge all our political class not to go into the question of who is authentic and who is grounded and certainly not take that abroad. Okay. That is something that is something for us to decide. I, I can't have, I, I must confess, I don't have the competence to go into this in detail, but I do have uh, this instinct that uh, this is a question uh, where our popular choices at different stages in our historical evolution over the last 75 years have been different. But at each time, it's the people who made these choices freely and fairly. No one has ever questioned the, the integrity of our elections. And that is something that is admired the world over. So and you should not enter into this issue, especially from the UN forum. I'm just picking up on the phrase you used. No one should question the integrity of our elections. Those were your precise words. Mr. Jay Shankar, in effect, is doing precisely that. I don't think he's doing that. I, I, I you just said again, so. Uh, Forgive me. No, you just said so. I quoted your words back to you. No, no one should question the integrity of our election process. And uh, by suggesting that these, these were less authentic, less grounded, uh, again, it is for Mr. Jay Shankar to reveal his mind more fully. But uh, I have said what I did. Uh, okay, let's come, let's come to a third point you make about Mr. Jay Shankar's speech. It arises out of what he said when he presented the Prime Minister's five pledges to the United Nations General Assembly. He said, we will liberate ourselves from a colonial mindset. You point out that this means that he was telling the UN that India remains colonial and needs to be liberated. That is a very odd thing to say to the United Nations in the year when India celebrates 75 years of independence. Look, uh, that formulation surprised me. Uh, the formulation is two. That's the second pledge. He says, two, we will liberate ourselves uh, from a colonial mindset. This is a categorical statement. The word we, he's speaking as India's representative. So the word we can only apply to India as a whole, the Indian people as a whole. And when he then qualifies it further ourselves, again, it reinforces that. Now, certainly it cannot be his position that uh, the present government of which he is a part, the dispensation of which he is now a part, are colonial. In fact, this debate of uh, Mikole Putras, non Mikole Putras are all internal. They are taking place here. I, for one, uh, don't subscribe to these views because whatever may have been Mikole is, and allow me this discretion, uh, this uh, little digression, whatever may have been Mikole's uh, intentions, the Indian Renaissance ensured that we, that the Indian people responded nationally discovering the roots of their civilization and were very proud of what what we were and, and uh, what we became. The national struggle under Gandhiji was something which the world admired. Now I come back to this point. So to then say that uh, we must liberate ourselves from our colonial mindset 
as I wrote in my article, seems to me to be a slip. Because certainly it can't be his position that he is part of a colonial mindset dispensation. And, but a slip which is now part of the UN record. So I that is what let me, let, me. let me make a point there. Whether it's a slip or not, we don't know. It's your assumption it's a slip. Yes, and certainly, you that, certainly. And you make that assumption on the grounds that it's not conceivable that the foreign minister would consider himself, his prime minister and his government as being colonial in their mindset and needing liberation. That is the basis on which you think it's a slip. But the truth of the matter is, and you began by pointing this out, that when he uses the word we and thereafter uses the word ourselves, he's clearly talking about all of India. And therefore, he's actually, in terms of what he said, indicated that he, his government, his prime minister also have a colonial mindset and need to be liberated. It may be a slip, but that's what he said nonetheless. Uh, well, I'm afraid I have to agree with you, though I underline that I think it is a slip. Slips should not take place, but they take place. I mean, I've been part of this a system. I was part of a system and I know slips take place. Can I, so, can, uh, I, can, I, can, I can I interrupt that? If, if it yes, is possible please. that this is a slip, an accident, carelessness, then could it be possible that the earlier two issues we've talked about, where he spoke about centuries of foreign attacks, where he spoke about authentic voices and grounded leadership, that those also may be slips and accidents. Is it possible that if he's made a slip here, he may have made careless slips there as well? No, I, I think there, uh, there is some application, uh, well, some uh, clearly focus. But here it's categorical. And here it's, log it's, it's logical because it, it defeats the very purpose of what he is what he is supposed to be supposed to have said and what the what I think the prime minister meant when he said uh, the second pledge that whatever vestiges of colonialism that may remain in the next 25 years we will get rid of them. He has not drawn a distinction between that there are some sections in India which are colonial. We have some vestiges. He makes a categorical statement. So that is why I am saying that this seems to be a slip. Now, there are, in fact, further ramifications to this one sentence that he said. And I'm repeating that sentence before I go on. The sentence was, we will liberate ourselves from a colonial mindset. That sentence could also undermine the esteem with which the world has viewed India's record as a pioneer and leader in the global decolonization process. Clearly, Mr. Jay Shankar, without realizing it perhaps, was attacking something that actually we in India should be very proud of. We are proud of it. I think that's a remarkable uh, India was held in the highest esteem in fact, it's a pioneer and a leader of the decolonization process. Now, one can't argue that we had a colonial mindset and yet we were leading a decolonization process. That's a contradiction, clearly. And it, it can't be that, that all this African, uh, these African leaders looked upon India, that Martin, that Martin Luther King considered Gandhiji as, as an ideal. And that, that was the way to liberate and uh, struggle against injustice. And yet, we say that we are colonial. So people will say that it's a strange thing. You were colonial and you were still leading a, a battle against colonialism and were the leaders of decolonization. So this contradiction, I think, uh, is again, if I'm using the word troubling. In fact, this contradiction raises one further point. I'll begin by quoting you. You write in that article, India's role in the entire decolonization process after the Second World War is one which this country can be justifiably proud of. And the truth is, major world leaders, Mandela, Kenneth Kaunda, Nairere, but also Nasir, Sukarno, Nkrumah, even Tito, recognized India's role 
applauded India for that role and held India as a result in high esteem. Mr. Jay Shankar has simply dismissed all of that and in effect seems to throw it in the dustbin. Well, uh, I think when slips take place, uh, and this I do believe is a slip, some rectification is required because certainly uh, Mr. Jay Shankar himself, uh, or Dr. Jay Shankar as we should call him, uh, would uh, not like to throw that record uh, into the dustbin. I am confident that Dr. Jay Shankar, as, uh, as a very illustrious uh, diplomat, and he truly is an outstanding, was an outstanding diplomat, his record shows that, and as a former colleague, I can vouch for it. I would realize that uh, that record is something that we must uphold and be proud of. But you know, the point is that there has been no comeback to you after your article. There's been no correction publicly after the speech was made and the speech was made at least three weeks ago. And that is the interesting point. Even if the lapses, errors or interpretations that you put on the speech were not picked up earlier, once you wrote your article in the Hindu on Friday, they were there in black and white for everyone to see. So if the ministry or the foreign minister didn't issue corrections earlier, they should have done so on Friday after you went public. But as you said in your first answer, there's total silence. Well, I don't expect them to come back to me. But if uh, this issue has been brought out and uh, you focused on it uh, in, in this particular segment uh, of, your, uh, of your interviewing process, then perhaps there will be a little focus on this. Uh, and. Uh, Let's see what happens then. But I look, I have no illusions about myself in this. I okay. do an analysis and I put it forward when I think it's necessary to be put forward. And that's what I did in this, this particular piece. One I don't last have any question. special expertise. One last question. If, if India still has a colonial, colonial mindset and needs to be liberated from it, do we deserve permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council? Should we be uh, heading the G20, which we will by the end of this year? Should we be heading, no, I, we soon will, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization? After Mr. Jay Shankar's speech, can't our critics raise these questions? No, I think that that's stretching it too far, Karan, because after all, in the UN Security Council, there are uh, permanent members who are old colonial states. In G22, there are old colonial states. So old colonial states can't tell us that uh, because there's a perception here that there are there's some colonial mindset, uh, you don't have the right to uh, sit uh, on no, the side. No, I'm not uh, saying... Uh, that, that, uh, forgive uh, me. That's stretching it too Forgive far. me, I'm not saying that any members of the P5 will say to us, you have a colonial mentality and you've revealed it and accepted it yourself. There are others who are opposed to our joining the Security Council. Italy, Pakistan, Argentina, they could raise this. And all they need to do is to say, you have yourself incriminated yourself with your foreign minister's speech. He accepts and admits you have a colonial mindset. You are not as yet liberated from it. Therefore, that's one reason why you shouldn't be on the Security Council. I'm saying people like that could use this against us if they want. Well, Italy can't because Italy was a colonial power too. So uh, let's not go into Italy and Germany and Japan and, and these countries. Uh, I'm more more concerned with how the South, the global South, which we are courting, and rightly, we've been leaders in the global South. We, after all, uh, gave voice to their aspirations. Uh, I'm a little more concerned with uh, how they will view uh, uh, this particular categorical sentence if it comes to their attention. Uh, that is, is, is a greater concern that I have. My last question, and I'm repeating deliberately a question I asked you earlier because I think it is fundamental. This series of statements, 
we've discussed three separate ones, were made by a man who served for three years as foreign secretary, for five years as ambassador in China, for a year and a bit as ambassador in Washington. There are few diplomats who are as experienced and maybe I'll add as talented as Mr. Jay Shankar. And therefore, I repeat the question, were these deliberate or do you think they are accidents and a result of carelessness? I know you've answered it again, but I think it's important I make you face up to the question one more time. A quick answer. Were they deliberate, well thought out and conscious or are they results of carelessness and accidental use of language? Uh, Karan, on the first part of your statement, uh, where you described Jay Shankar's professional record, I uh, entirely agree. As I told you, he's a colleague we've all held in the highest esteem for his competence, uh, for his knowledge, for his erudition. Uh, the second part, I think I would leave it to him if he chose to, to explain this or clarify this. I can't speak for him because this is, after all, uh, something that he has to clarify. I can't, uh, I've only said what is in the text of his statement okay. and I've drawn some conclusions from it. I can't go into his mind. I wasn't actually asking you to go into his mind, but never mind. You're giving the same answer you gave earlier and you have every right to do so. Nonetheless, people have every right to ask. I, I, Has I, this been I, done I, deliberately? No, no I'll add one accidental? sentence. I, I, I'll add one sentence. I wish the formulations were different. Okay. Undoubtedly. Otherwise, you wouldn't have written your article. I thank you for this interview and I thank you for explaining in greater detail than you did in the Hindu why you thought these formulations are, as you put it, deeply troubling. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Karan. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye.